Hello and welcome back to another episode in CSC 280, the introduction to cybersecurity. Today's topic, role-based access control, uh, which is the last of the videos in the access control mini-series. As we talked about in previous videos, we introduced um, some of the principles behind access control. Um, we discussed the difference between access control and authorization. And we basically said in order to do that, we have to figure out a model by which we can specify those um, authorizations so that the access control system, the reference monitor, can enforce them. We talked about discretionary access control and mandatory access control as two access control models that can be used to specify such policies and enforce them, but both of them had disadvantages associated with them in addition to their benefits. Today we'll talk about role-based access control, which is the next iteration in access control and, you know, as uh, things go, uh, that's what most current well-defined access control models are at least in part based on. So what we've seen so far with both mandatory and discretionary access control is that overhead is a big issue. Uh, the systems grow a lot. There's many different states in which a system can reside. And as a result, it's often difficult to identify what permissions someone has or what permissions are defined on a particular object. And so reducing this overhead um, is beneficial for transparency. And transparency and simplicity are friends of um, security. You could say the other way around, complexity is the enemy of security. So what we're looking for is a model that is intuitive, simple, and that scales well. And role-based access control goes a long way into giving us that. The idea is that Instead of assigning privileges directly to subjects, so do the authorization at that level, we're going to put a level of indirection in between. We're going to say, okay, if I am subject to access control, then I am doing that because I have certain responsibilities. And so I play a particular role in the access control system. I am going to assign a subject to a role. And then because of me being assigned a role, I will receive certain privileges, which means that privileges are also mapped to a role. And I've created an indirection there where subjects map to roles and privileges map to roles. And when you put those together, I have an indirect way of going from subject to object or to uh, privilege. There's a couple of benefits there. First benefit is that that second mapping, the mapping between objects or privileges and roles is mostly stable. Um, and it does not change nearly as much as the mapping between subjects and roles. And that's a good thing because even if I can only eliminate part of the moving complexity of my access control model, the overall picture becomes better. The mapping between roles and users is often fairly intuitive. At least it starts out that way. In practice, it goes complex rather quickly. Um, and even more so now is that I'm able to enforce separations of duties. I can now go to a point where I might be able to say, listen, I am assigned the role of a web developer. Someone else is assigned the role of a deployment manager, someone who's going to take the work that the web developer did and made it live on the system. We don't want those two roles to be combined in the same persons. That way, you know, by having that separation of duty there, we minimize the risk that someone is going to code malicious, um, uh, code, write malicious code and push it into production themselves. If my access control system has a mechanism in place that it can enforce that I am not both a developer and a deployment manager, you know, we're, we're up for the best. And it is a reasonable assumption to do and not very complex to understand. I don't have to necessarily go into every single detail as to why I can't do certain things. All I do is stick at the level of roles. And then as people move in and out of roles, the access control system adjusts, but the policies stay the same. So other than intuitiveness, overhead is reduced by using role-based access control. Let's take a very simple model. Let's say that we have a situation in which we have, let's say four privileges, read, write, execute, and delete. 
we have five roles and maybe a hundred individuals who play those five roles and maybe a hundred objects on which privileges are defined. If I would have to do this in a discretionary access control system, I would map my object to my subject um, and factor in those different privileges. So what I would get is a state of potentially four times 100 times 100 is 40,000 possible authorizations that I need to maintain. And that's a big number even for a small system as this. Not only would it be a big um, system in terms of authorization state, there would be no single point where I can look and say, what is my system like? You know, the, 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 scat the, the authorizations are scattered over the owners of the resources. Now bring in access control. We're first going to figure out what that big mapping is, the mapping between the objects and the roles. Um, and say, in this case, that I have a hundred um, of those objects I had five roles and four privileges. I can just multiply those out and I get 2,000. Four times 100 is 400. Five times 400 is 2,000. 2,000 is already less than 40,000. And that's easy math. But the second part is that 2,000 number is stable or mostly stable. It's not going to change all that much. Especially if we start looking at the second mapping, the, the one that is more dynamic, the one between subjects and roles. Um, it's a very simple one. I have a hundred subjects, I have five roles, so I have 500 possible combinations. 500 is less than 2000 and 2000 was less than 40,000. Now, the benefit is that now I don't have to multiply 4000 and my um, um, 2000 and my 500, I can just add them up together, which means that I get a total number of mappings to maintain of 2500. So 2,500 instead of 40,000 is a major leap forward, um, especially knowing that of those 2,500, really only 500 are the ones that is probably require ongoing and regular maintenance. And basically what happened is that instead of 40,000, I really have to only do regular maintenance on about 500 possible states. So that, that's a very big gain right there. Um, it's also more intuitive. It, it now makes a lot more sense where I don't necessarily care about what it, each individual person needs. As long as I know what the role is they're playing, their privileges will follow from that. So um, graphic representation uh, on the left of the figure, what we'll see is on the first column are the users. The users are mapped to roles and the roles are mapped to objects um, through permissions, or maybe the other way around. Permissions are mapped to roles, roles are mapped to users. But the key point is here, these are many too many mappings. So I can have a user play multiple roles. I can have a role have multiple permissions. Um, a permission can be part of multiple roles as well. And so even though there's a lot of interaction happening there, because it's so intuitive, it is easier to understand and easier to track. Some of the access control models will also allow us to organize roles in a hierarchy. So let's um, look, for example, at the Right, um, right hand side of this, this, this image here, um, where we might say, you know, everyone in our community has a basic set, minimum set of privileges. For example, anyone who has in the Adelphi community an ID number has a swipe card, and with that swipe card, you can get into the parking garage. So at that point, I would assign the privilege of entering the parking garage at that top level role. Everybody has it. But from that point on, the rights start diverging a little bit. For example, I could be a student, I could be a faculty member, or I could be a staff member. And maybe I am a combination of those. This system will allow me to do that. But I can say, okay, so let's say, what can students do? Well, students can register for classes and students can receive grades. Uh, faculty members cannot register for classes. They cannot receive grades, but they can give grades, which means that um, even though we have a common base, we start diverging from there. And maybe administration has yet other permissions. Now I could, for example, also write at this point that a faculty member is allowed to take classes. So you can be a faculty member and a student at the same time. But what we can also do now is say, but not at the same time. 
Um, in other words, you cannot, as a faculty member, you cannot be your own student. Because I have the ability to write roles and I can define constraints between roles, I can now express very easily in um, policy that someone cannot be their own student. I did not have that capability before. And by being able to organize what I do in roles and organize those roles in hierarchies, I do gain additional capabilities that I didn't have before. To make it a little easier to reason about this, all these different new features that our role-based access control model gives us can be broken down into four base models. Role-based access control model zero, the base model, talks about that concept of users being assigned to roles and roles being mapped to privileges. Role-based access control level zero also introduces the concept of sessions, and that means that I can define um, restrictions both just unconditional or conditional on runtime. And what I mean by that is the following. This idea where I can be a student and a faculty member at the same time. Yeah, I can. I can take someone else's classes. So it's not a re restriction that is active all of the time. It's only active when I'm actually using it. That's called the dynamic separation of duty. Um, I might have others that are always the case. So, for example, the, the deployment manager and the developer, they should never be the same person whether or not they have them active. Otherwise, you could develop your code, deactivate your developer role, activate your deployment manager role, and then deploy. You don't want that. That would be a static separation of duty. If I start adding hierarchies to those roles where um, the highest level um, role in the hierarchy has the least number of privileges and the lowest has the most, that's called RBAC1. It builds on RBAC0, that base concept, um, with users, roles, privileges, and sessions, and then adds those hierarchies. Also building on that base concept, but not including the hierarchies, only the constraints, so the, the separations of duty. That's called RBAC2. And then if I combine everything together, hierarchies um, and constraints and objects and users and etc. At that point, I have RBAC3, which is the most complete version of the model and also the most flexible one. That's the basic idea of role-based access control. In reality, we'll never see a system that is purely discretionary or purely role-based or purely mandatory. It always takes elements of both. As that happens and as we start combining these things, what we do have to be aware of is what are the capabilities that we're borrowing and what are the consequences of us borrowing those things. But in the end, that is what access control is all about. We adopt a model that allows us to specify policies. Those policies determine our authorizations and the access control system enforces them.